your performance. Uh, because not only are they going to share their written works with you, but afterwards they're going to open up the floor for a nice discussion, question and answer period, things in the literary world, publishing world, and writing, and share their successes with you because they are dynamic. And you don't get that any place else with the inspired world, right? <laughs> now, Mike dubbed them literary soulmates. I'm also dubbing them literary, literary royalty because these two are fantastic in their field. She is national slam champion many times over, all right? Journalist, professor, author, award-winning nominated book, Blood Dazzle, was nominated for the National Book Award, which is a story of Hurricane Katrina. And she'll be reading selections from her new book, Should Have Been Jimmy Savannah. She's gonna bring all that to the table tonight. Appearing with her as a husband, he is a former journalist, a former investigative reporter, all right? He is a crime fiction novelist, and his debut novel won the Edgar Award, which is given out for best debut novel, all right? So now you get an idea of why I call them literary royalty, because they do it and they do it well. And they're going to share their works and share their minds with you tonight. So, if you're ready, I need you to start picking up the energy. If you're ready to be inspired, Mr. Bruce, Bruce De Silva and Patricia Smith. Thank you, Captain Dill. Evan 
of uh, you know, Autumn looked at me, took a shot. He said, really? Evan Hunter wrote you that note. I said, yeah. I said, come on. Really? He said, yeah, they still have it. I, I can show it to you if you want to see it. He said, well, Evan Hunter had been a really, really good friend of mine. Before he died, we used to have dinner together at least once a month. And in all the years I knew him, I never heard him say a single good word about anything anyone else wrote. Evan thought he was the only one who could write. So if, if he really wrote you that note, then you have to finish that novel. And when it's done, you have to let me read it. So I went home and I told Patricia what had happened. And I started writing after work, at night, and on weekends. And six months later, I had a book. One of the things I learned from that very, very quickly is if you write just 800 words a day, which isn't very much, in a, in a hundred days, you've got an 80,000 word crime novel. You know, it's not as, as big a task as it might seem. So I'm going to read uh, a little bit from, from uh, not from the first book, uh, Rogue Island. This is the first book, just out now in trade paperback. It's been in hardcover for a while. Uh, but I'm going to read um, a little bit first from the, um, uh, the first part of the book in progress now, the third novel. One of the things I really care about when I write is pacing and tone. I pay a lot of attention to that. And I really like it when the tone and pace of a book change as you go along. It gives a novel, it's one of the things that gives a novel a sense of movement of going forward. And so this, uh, I hope, is an example of me uh, succeeding in doing that. Uh, you'll see the tone and pace change very dramatically from one uh, short section to another. So it begins like this. And again, this is a work in progress. July 1984. The boy holds the mason jar up to the light and studies the rippling mass inside, the quivering antennae, the thrashing legs, the compound eyes, the gossamer wind is folded tight against segmented green abdomens. The unmowed field behind his house is alive with him. He'd spent half the morning stalking these bits of life, snatching them from the waving blades of switchgrass with his big, strong hands. On his knees now, he opens the jar, snares one with a thick finger, and screws the lid on tight. He places the prisoner on one of the flat stones that litter the field and holds it down with his left thumb. Then he reaches into the pocket of his jeans and extracts his five-power magnifying glass. The sun is high, and the glass focuses its wrath into a tight beam. A wing curls into ash. The grasshopper struggles, its six legs making a faint scratching sound as they rake the stone. The boy burns the legs off one by one and the scratching stops. Carefully he amputates each antenna. A brown, unblinking eye stares up at him, pleading for an end to this. He stares back, relishing the moment. Then he drags the beam across the abdomen into the eye, instantly obliterating it. A thin curl of white smoke rises as he bores through the, to the knot of ganglia that pass for a brain. The boy bends close, sniffs. The aroma reminds him of meat cooking in his mother's kitchen. With a start, he feels something swell in his jeans. He wonders, am I God? March 2011. Larry Bird had been living in Mulligan's kitchen for less than a week and already he'd become a big pain in the ass. Every day he shredded the newspaper he was supposed to shit on kicked it through the bars of his cage and walked, watched it drop, shit and all, onto the scuffed linoleum floor. Every night he let out two or three skull-piercing shrieks that made Mulligan bolt from his bed and grope for his gun. Larry knew only one English phrase and he didn't squawk it often, but when he did, Mulligan had to fight the urge to strangle him. Mulligan brushed his teeth, tucked on his jeans, put on a Boston Red Sox t-shirt with Carl Crawford's number 13 on the back, and was tying his black Reeboks when the fucker said it. Yankees win! Hey, Yankees win! <laughs> Mulligan couldn't figure it. Why would a guy named a bird after one of the greatest sports heroes in New England history and then teach it to top that crap? <laughs> but 
there was no way to find out now because the asshole responsible for this abomination was dead. Mulligan would have preferred a dog. A big one that would jump all over him when he came home from work, curl up beside him when he watched the socks on TV, and snore contentedly every night at the foot of his bed. After several recent disappointments, he'd come to believe that the love of a god was preferable to the love of a woman. Gods were unvariably faithful, and not a one had ever lied to him. But the landlord didn't allow dogs in this rundown tenement building in Providence's Federal Hill neighborhood. And with Mulligan's crazy hours, there was no way he could take care of one anyway. The asshole, a small-time heroin dealer, had been sitting on the stoop outside an apartment in the Chad Brown housing project last Wednesday. When a new Escalade rolled up, the passenger side slid down, and a dozen 9 millimeter slugs stuttered out. An hour later, Mulligan ducked under the yellow crime scene tape and yanked his reporter's notebook from his hip pocket. He doubted he'd need it. But he figured on being ready in case the investigating detective broke the precedent and said something worth printing in the Providence Dispatch. They just started rambling when a uniform lugged a big brass cage out of the apartment and set it down on the blood on the stoop. Oops, he said. Sorry about that, Sarge. No biggie, the detective said. Really? Didn't I just compromise the physical evidence? Compromise, Mulligan said. It's what they're taught to say at the police academy, the detective said. What they really, what they really mean is fucked up. Oh, shit, the uniform said. I can't believe I did that. Doesn't matter, kid, the detective said. It doesn't? It might if we went to trial, the detective said. But it's not like we're ever going to ID the shooter. Mulligan and the detective watched the uniform lift the page from the stoop. A little metal sign clipped with the bars read, Larry Bird. Inside the cage, a midnight blue macaw squatted and took a dump. Looks like you've got a witness, Mulligan said. Yeah, the uniform said. He must have heard the whole thing go down. But the ship bird ain't talking. I don't think he likes cops. Likes cops. Birds of a feather, Mulligan said, and immediately regretted the cliché. You got that right, the detective said. He pointed at the fresh, at the fresh graffiti scrawled next to the apartment door. If you see something, don't say anything. Handsome bird, Mulligan said. If you want it, it's yours, the detective said. You serious? Why not? The scale of all the holes in him won't be feeding it anymore, and I'd just as soon avoid dealing with the lazy perks at animal control. Which is how Larry Bird found a new home in Mulligan's kitchen and promptly dedicated himself to soiling it. Mulligan finished tying his shoes, filled Larry's water bottle and feeding tubes, got bitten on the hand for his trouble. He told the bird to go fuck himself and went out the apartment door. He trotted down one flight of worn wooden stairs and stepped out into the light morning rain. Thanks, Patricia. Knees, 
sporting one swirling back the ski slope of a hat. She rides the rattling elevator to a windy city spire and pulls back her gulp as the elevator hurtles to heaven. Then she's stiffly seated at a scarred oak table across from a white government-sanctioned savior who has dedicated eight hours a week to straightening afflicted black tongues. She guides my mother patiently through lazy ings and herbs, slowly scraping her throat clean of the moist and raging infection of Aliceville, Alabama. There are barely muttered apologies for colored sounds. There is much beginning again. I want to talk right before I die. I want to stop saying ink and I done been like I ain't got no sense. I'm a grown woman. I done lived too long to be so stupid, acting like I just got off the boat. My mother has never been on a boat. But 50 years ago, merely a million of her, clutching strapped cases, Jets, Emmett Till issue, and thick peppered chicken wings and wax bags, stepped off rumbling buses at northern stations in Detroit, in Philly, in the bricked cornfield of Chicago. Brushing stubborn scarlet dust from their shoes, they said, we're north now slinging it at back door syllable, as if those three words were vessels big enough to hold country folks overwrought ideas of life. Two. Back then, my mother thought it a modern miracle, this new living in a box stacked upon other boxes, where every flat surface reeked of Lysol and effort, and chubby roaches, cross-eyed with rain, dragged themselves across freshly washed dishes and dropped dizzy from the ceiling into our Murphy beds, our wash tubs, our open steaming pots of collars. Of course, there was a factory just two bus rides close, a job that didn't involve white babies or blue laundry, where she worked in tense line with other dreamers, repeatedly, 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 all those oily, hot combed heads drooping, no talking as scarred brown hands romance machines, just the sound of doing it right and juicy fruit crackling. A mere mindset away, there had to be a corner tavern where dead blues men begged second chances for the juke, and where my mama, perched man wary on a comfortable stool by the door, could look like a Christian who was just leaving. And on Sunday, at Pilgrim Rest Missionary Baptist Church, she would pull on the pure white gloves of service and wail to the rafters when the Holy Ghost hot hand grew itchy and insistent at the small of her back. She was his child, finally loosed of that damnable delta, building herself anew in this land of sidewalks, blue jukes, and sizzling fried perch and virgin white boxes. See her, all nap burned from her crown, one gold tooth winking, Soft hair riding her lip, blouses starched hard, Orlon sweaters with smatterings of stitched roses, A-line skirts, the color of unleashed winter. Three. My mother's voice is like homemade cornbread, slathered with butter, full of places for heat to hide. When she is pissed, it punches straight out and clears the room. When she is scared, it turns practical, matter of fact, like when she called to say, they found your daddy this morning. Somebody shot him. He's dead. He ain't come to work this morning. I know something was wrong. When mama talks, the southern swing of it is wild with unexpected blooms, like the fields she never told me about in Alabama. Her rap is peppered with ain't gots and I done bins and he bees, just like mine is when I'm color among color. During worship, when talk becomes song, her voice collapses and loses all acquaintance with key. So of course, it's my mother's fractured alto wailing above everybody, uncaged, unapologetic, and creaking toward heaven. Now, she wants to sound proper when she gets there. A woman got some sense in future need to upright herself, talk English instead of talking wrong. It's strange to hear the precise rote of Annie Pearl's new mouth. She slips sometimes, but is proud when she remembers to bite down on dirt-crafted contractions. 
and double negatives. Sometimes I wonder whatever happened to the warm expanse of the red dust woman who arrived with just a little sin in all of the good wrong words. I dream her breathless, maybe leaning forward a little in her seat on the greyhound. I ain't never seen, she begins, grinning through the grime at Chicago, city of huge shoulders, thief of tongues. Thank you very much.